Father's Day, big shout out Father's Day um, uh, to all the fathers, to the dads, to those that have had to step in and fill that role. Um, I'm fortunate, you know, even when my parents, even after my parents got divorced, um, my mom never had to be dad. You know, we had a relationship with my dad, have a relationship with my dad, and it's gotten closer over the years. You know, that that has been a blessing. That has been a blessing. There was a period in time, I wouldn't say we were estranged, but we just certainly weren't very close, um, which is not to say that he wasn't a part of my life. I want to be clear about that and, and take a moment, if you would humor me, allow me to do this. Um, uh, you know, even after my parents got divorced, we, you know, we, we spent every other weekend with my dad and he was there. He came to not all the games, but he came to some of the games and some of the events and, and he was there. He was present. We had a relationship. I knew who my father was, um, but it was it was strained. I think, you know, we, we I could say that, that it was strained. Um, we didn't have a lot in common uh, as I was growing up. And, you know, I had some resentment and some things that I had to work through and and kind of grow into some maturity about. Right. As it pertains to um, the dynamics between a man and a woman and 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 what happens in marriages and relationships and. Um, you know, having having been divorced myself, just understand how complex, how complex relationships can be. And so over the years, my dad just, he stayed, you know, he just, he was consistent, he was steady, he was there, he stayed. And uh, over time, over the years, um, I thank the Lord, I'm going to start getting choked up. Um, I thank the Lord that we have been able to build a really beautiful relationship. And I have a good, strong relationship with my father. Today, I have a good, strong relationship with my father, with my dad, with my pops. I call him pops. Um, I've got a good relationship with pops and I'm, and I'm grateful. And I'm grateful because one of the lessons that I've taken away from my dad is, is to work. You know, I, 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 um, know how to get up and go to work every day. And that's because I saw my father do it to this day, um, almost 70 years of age and still um, uh, uh, working every day, um, taking some time off now. Y'all continue to pray for my dad. He had knee surgery a couple weeks ago and the recovery is going well, um, you know, but he, he he's going to recover from his knee surgery. He's going to go back to work um, as a welder, plumber, pipe fitter. Um, 69 years old, still welding pipes, still still dragging boilers, still working in wet, cold, damp, cramped spaces because he's got to work because he's got to. And 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 I've learned through the years and just watching him how to get up every day and go to work. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful. It's one of the most valuable lessons I ever take away from him is to get up, to get up and go to work, get up and and make it happen. Um, and, and, you know, I'm grateful, um, because, you know, again, our relationship was, was challenged early on, but I learned the value of being present. And one thing that I fought for and continue to fight for is a strong relationship with my children. Um, even at, uh, even as, um, my, my first wife and I were, were splitting and, and, and divorcing, um, something that was not on the table was losing relationship with my oldest child. That was not, it was not up for debate. It was not up for consideration. I was not going to be at every other weekend. Um, I was going to have full custody or we were going to have 50, 50 custody, but it was not going to be anything other than that. Um, and, you know, and, as, you know, she, she, she was, was amicable and, and we collaborated and made it work. Um, so this is not a, you know, casting judgment type of thing or, you know, me greater than thou. Nothing like that has happened. I just want to explain to y'all um, what this day means to me. Um, and, and and it's important because parents are important because two parents are important. And even in a world where. um where identity is, is for, for some folks, identity is fluid. And, you know, we're not going to use this opportunity to, to promote or push any particular agenda. But I think there is a formula that God designed that works really well. 
And I think the formula that works really well in families is a male and a female raising children. That's not to say that there aren't variations to that formula and that uh, that that other arrangements don't work. I, I, I'm, I'm certain that they do. I'm, I'm aware of some arrangements like that that do other arrangements, quote unquote, other arrangements that do work. But tried and true, <laughs> tested over the years um, is when you have um, a mom and a dad collaborating, working together to raise children. It really is a beautiful thing. And I'm grateful uh, that my wife, Rachel, allows me to be the kind of father that I want to be, that I need to be. Um, and she's not afraid to, to, to help me and coach me and, and point some things out. And, and I'm learning um, each and every day to, to, to do that for her, to be that for her. Um, so that we make each other better uh, for our children. And um, and I appreciate you giving me that space to do that. <laughs> Thank you for hanging in there. I hope I didn't lose anybody in that. Um, I appreciate y'all hanging in there with me. Let me do that. Um, so again, happy Father's Day. Um, and for those that have had to pick up the mantle, that's how I started down this path. For those that have had to pick up the mantle, um, because dad isn't around for whatever reason, um, we celebrate you today as well. Not because your mom and dad. Um, we celebrate you because you know we don't celebrate dads that are mom and dad. We celebrate parents um, that have had to fill the the void that was left by a partner, and so we salute and celebrate you um, today as well. Amen. Uh, God bless y'all. Appreciate y'all. We're wrapping up today. Um, we're finishing up the book of James. Um, the letter of James to to uh, Hebrew believers, to um, Jewish believers in um, the Messianic Christ, um, Jesus, the, the Redeemer. Uh, so we're going to finish that letter up today. A couple quick announcements um, as we jump in. Um, is, well, some uh, one will require a bit of explanation. Midweek recharge is up. So hopefully you've had a chance to check that out. The midweek recharge. Um, is up on our social media platform. So um, I hope we've had a chance to see that and share that and pass that along. Bible study is up on YouTube as well. Uh, we did uh, Bible study live via YouTube um, this past Thursday. And so that's on our YouTube channel as well. You go to youtube.com and search My Connected Church. You'll find our channel and all our content there. So Bible study is up. As it pertains to next week, um, uh, we're fortunate, uh, the family and I um, are, are going to have an opportunity uh, to take a little bit of a, a vacation. So I'm going to be away for a bit. I will get the midweek recharge up. Um, I will do the, the, the kind of the announcement on the messenger group as I did this week for Bible study. It's going to be tricky um, uh, because we'll be preparing to leave Thursday. Um, but if I can get to Bible study, even Wednesday evening, we, I would like to try to do Bible study this week because there will be no service next Sunday. The, um, that's going to be the 25th. So there will be no, no, no service next Sunday, the 25th. There will be no midweek recharge or Bible study all that week. So that last week of June, um, into July, there'll be no service the following Sunday. Um, which I think is uh, July 1st or July 2nd. Um, I don't add uh, the calendar up in front of me, but we're going to be off for, you know, for essentially um, two weeks. Uh, uh, this coming Sunday, uh, again, the 25th, and then the following Sunday, um, uh, uh, which would be the uh, 1st, July 1st, um, or July 2nd, because there's 30 days in June, July 2nd. Uh, there'll be no, there'll be no service um, for that. So um, I see my friend Leo, bless you, man. Happy Father's Day. Leo really enjoyed hanging out with you and celebrating um, your beautiful baby girl yesterday, man. Appreciate you. Love you, sir. Happy Father's Day to you. So we'll be off the next couple of weeks um, as the family and I are, are, are away. So um, a pray for us, pray for safe travels and, and, you know, that the Lord keeps us while we're away and we'll be thinking of you. Um, uh, but we're we going to take some time and kind of uh, uh, recharge the batteries a little bit and and, uh, and, and come back kind of fired up in July. All right. 
Um, uh, and then, of course, in July, uh, the 23rd through the 26th is uh, the Sea God First Annual Holy Convocation. Um, I hope you're excited about that. Uh, Miss Queen did end up registering with us, so we appreciate that, Miss Queen. Um, uh, uh, Holy Convocation, July 23rd through the 26th, right here in Meriden, Connecticut, at 262 B Street, 262 B Street in Meriden, Connecticut. So we're excited about that. We're going to be, I'm going to uh, facilitate a workshop um, Tuesday, Tuesday morning, I'm facilitating a workshop July 24th. Um, there at Upper Room, so I'm excited about that. I think I'm going to be participating in the, the the children's program, the youth program as well. There'll be services um, uh, uh, all that week, that Sunday through Wednesday um, as well. So if you're in the area and you want to stop by, we'd love for you to join us at Sea Guide Churches of Global Outreach and Deliverance, our first annual Holy Convocation. That's again, July 23rd through the 26th. Um, so appreciate that. Appreciate your patience. Um, pray with me as we seek the Lord's continued blessing over this service as we jump into the word. Lord God, creator of all the universe, thank you for fathers. Thank you that you are our father. You are our mother. You are our friend. You're the lover of our soul. You're the creator of all creation, and we're grateful and we're thankful. We appreciate all that you have done, all that you are for us. You are holiness. You are righteousness. You are love. And we can love and we can experience love because of you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to minister to your people on this day. I pray that the words that I share are your words, that I add nothing to, that I take nothing away that what is spoken today is that which you have ordained to be spoken from the beginning of the world, that every listener, every viewer has a heart and a mind ready to receive, that the seed you plant today, that you plant today, will be watered, that an increase would come forward to bring souls, to bring more lives into your kingdom so that the world can glorify you. In the name of Jesus, the Redeemer of the world, we pray. Amen, amen. Again, family, thank you so much for being here. This is Sunday Sessions for Connecting, the weekly Sunday morning service for My Connected Church. My name is Charles Botts. I'm the pastor and founder here. We are thrilled, honored, excited, and humbled that you have chosen to take the time to stop by and hang out with us for one more Sunday. So we are wrapping up the letter of James. If you can believe it has been a powerful letter, it's been um, an empowering letter, it's been um, a letter of accountability, it's been a letter of correction. You know, James has gotten us together and James is still getting us together. Um, and and James, James does not pull back as he ends this letter. He does not let up. James is still walking heavy and swinging tough as we wrap up this letter. So grab your Bibles. James chapter one, starting at verse one, we're looking at the NIV. That's the New International Version. That translation, as you saw on Facebook, when you join the subject, the topic for today's message is patient suffering, patient suffering. Um, which is, uh, I think, something that we we don't always truly appreciate. I preach about it a lot um, here at Connected Church. It's something that is often um, not necessarily welcome. Um, it's something uh, that is not necessarily um, a, a, a too exciting to pray about, uh, to preach about. It is not necessarily a topic that is very popular. It's it's not necessarily something that's going to get a whole bunch of people to to click on your uh, your video or to engage in your content because we don't we don't want to think about suffering, right? It's it, there's too much suffering as it is, and then I got to come into to to church. I got to come into the spirit of the Lord where there's supposed to be liberty and freedom and healing and life, and 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 hear and learn and realize that there's suffering in Christianity as well, that they're suffering in Christ. Come on. 
when, when, when do we get a break from it all? I understand. I understand intimately that expression, that feeling. And, and um, this is what the Lord uh, says to preach. And, and this is what um, I, I candidly, um, uh, where I find myself um, in assembling my notes and, and using technology and resources available to pull this together, this is the direction that we're going in. And it's important. It's an important one. James chapter five, verse one, the New International Version of God's holy word reads, now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Whoa, <laughs> hold on, I, I'm out. <laughs> misery that is coming to me simply because I'm rich? I haven't even done anything, James. I, I happen to have made some good choices or, or you know, I was diligent or I have this really unique offering or I, I'm, I'm savvy, I'm wise when it comes to business. And you're telling me that misery is coming, that I need to weep and wail because misery is coming. Verse two, your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have built rockets to fly to Mars and you don't pay your workers a livable wage. What? Oh, no, that's not what it says. I must be, I don't know where that came from. That's, that's a, I guess that's the box translation. You have fattened yourselves in the days of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Th th this is a clear indictment. James is picking up right where he left off, left off in chapter four. If you recall, we looked at chapter four last week um, uh, where we talked about the tongue right? That tongue, that little member, a weapon of mass destruction, that tongue, um, that, that uh, uh, it, it, it affects the whole body. It inflames the whole body. James says he compares it to the bit that goes in the horse's mouth that's attached to the stirrups. He compared it to the rudder of a ship, that a rudder uh, is able to control the movement of a massive ship and the bit is what gives the rider control over a huge, powerful, strong horse. So the tongue is this little member, but it controls, it can set a flame the whole body. I quoted, I told you all about my former pastor, Pastor Beltry, said that you could shoot a rocket, you could shoot a missile and it would land a thousand miles away, but you could say a word, you could shoot a word, and it could do damage years into the future, not just miles away, but time. The tongue is so powerful. And James concluded chapter four, we or, or that section, it wasn't written in chapters, but you understand, concluded that section talking about the two different kinds of wisdom, that there's a wisdom that is pertaining to selfish ambition, bitter envy and selfish ambition. And that that was a path to destruction, but there was selfless. There was selfless giving. There was pure, peace-loving, considered and submissive wisdom that came from the world. And so he goes from the tongue, this little member that sets aflame the whole body and how that is then manifest and carried out through these different kinds of wisdom. There's selfish wisdom that leads to only gain for self, but then there's selfless, there's godly wisdom that is pure and submissive and peace-loving. And so then James indicts the wealthy because he's accusing the wealthy of having worldly wisdom and their tongues and, and, and being set aflame by their selfish ambition that they have not paid their workers. 
my God, and we're still dealing with the same thing, that their wealth has come on the backs of poor laborers that they've mistreated and they've underpaid and they've lived a life of luxury. But their day of accounting is coming. Misery is coming is what James says. Misery for the wealthy. For those that have gained their wealth through worldly wisdom, through the wisdom of corruption. Through the wisdom that says in order for me to make as much money as I can, I got to lowball and I got to mistreat and I got to I, 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 I got to walk away from deals. I, 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 I got to commit resources and commit time and and get these 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 cities and get these property owners to sign the deal. But then I walk away. And I leave them stranded. Yeah, you know, you know about real so-called real estate moguls that buy properties and, and, and for pennies on the dollar and and commit to to doing all these renovations and commit to doing all these upkeep and 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 they either become slum lords or they just walk off the project altogether and there's no legal recourse. And so cities and 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 tenements and and co-ops are left hanging the bag with construction projects half done or half completed because the the the, the savvy uh, real estate mogul uh, uh, abused a relationship one more time. Wail and weep, you wealthy, because judgment is coming. I, I read scriptures like this, and I continue to to have a really hard time understanding how we can read scriptures like this and think for a moment that God is somewhere desperate for his children to be rich. I'm still having a hard time understanding how pastors can 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 try to preach a message of prosperity that God designed us to be wealthy. There's a warning here. Oh, but Charles, come on, pastors talking about uh, 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 those that have made their money through ill-gotten gains, those that have made their money through 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 uh, 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 and lying and deceit and not paying their workers. It's not it's not talking about preachers that 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 uh, are uh, are experiencing wealth because. Uh, uh, the people that that attend their services and the people uh, they just want to support them. They want to be a blessing to them. They want to they want to give to them. It is a problem if you're creating an environment where someone is deciding between if they have enough for their children, if they can if, if they can invest in their children's education, or if they should be giving to you. It is a problem if you put yourself in a place where if someone is deciding whether they should uh, save for retirement or give to you. I'm not even talking about uh, those that are despicable enough to create an environment uh, where people are living on, 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 on cat food, where, where people are living on pet food because they can't afford proper nutrition now, uh, because they're giving their money to the church. Uh, I'm not even talking about those that are days away from eviction of those that are days away from getting kicked out uh, because they're giving all their money to the church uh, and the pastor's talking about just hang in there a little while longer. Uh, your deliverance is yet come. You are a thief uh, and you're a liar and judgment is coming. That's wealth that has been gained through worldly wisdom. Jesus accepted the generosity of those that were investing in his ministry so that he had food to eat. Jesus accepted the generosity of those that were investing in his ministry so that he had a place to sleep. Mm. I'm going to, I'm the, the, the spirit is subject to the prophet. I want to keep going down this path, but that's not, that's not, that's, that's not what this is about. 
but it's a warning. And it's a clear warning. And there's nothing wrong with prosperity that is gained through pure, peace-loving, submissive wisdom. There's nothing wrong with a pastor being supported by those that find what the pastor is preaching to be life-giving as long as those that are supporting are themselves supported. You should never give to the pastor if you can't pay your bill. And I know, I know there's wisdom out there and, and I've quoted him before and, 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 and I respect the wisdom out there that says what's in your hand if it's not doesn't meet your need, it's a seed. No. I'm I'm not I'm not going to I can't stand by that. I can't stand by that any longer. I understand the concept that it and it sounds good and you give in faith and if you give in faith that that, that God will turn it around. Yes. Yes, God can. Yes. Yes, God can. It doesn't mean that God will. We putting God in a situation. We trying to paint God into a corner where it's like, Lord, you said, you said, you said, God doesn't work that way. Jesus was in the garden praying, sweat and drops of blood, begging not to go to the cross. Nevertheless, not my will. We painting God into a corner like God's got to do it. God's got to show up. If God don't do it, it can't be done. Well, sometimes it just won't be done because you were unwise with your choices. Jesus, when it came to the taxes, they asked Jesus, do you pay the temple tax? And he asked them to, he asked them for a denarii. And he said, well, whose picture is on the denarii or the engraving? And he said it was Caesar. And Jesus' response is, give to Caesar what's Caesar. Give God to what's God. Give to God what's God. We owe God our worship. We owe God our praise. We owe God our, 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 our love. We owe God our lives. But y'all trying to create this scenario where if I give to the church, if I give to the church, if I give to the church, th then God has to know. No, it doesn't work that way. God is not an ATM. God is not a genie. Also, God is not a math equation. God is not a computer program. God is not an if-then statement. If I do this, then God has to do that. No, God does not. You're talking about the creator of the universe. God is not somewhere, oh, well, they gave their 10% this month. I, I, I guess I got to, you know, figure out a way to keep the lights on. That's not anywhere in scripture. You reap what you sow. Okay, you. I understand that. We can. We can use. I don't even know how I'm all the way over here, but God is saying something. Yes, you reap what you sow. Absolutely. And and, and so if you want an apple tree, you got to plant apple seeds. You can't uh, plant apple seeds and think that you're going to get a pear tree. Yes, a thousand percent. I understand that. You got to have the seeds to plant to begin with. And that takes time. It's not just putting the seed in the ground. And what happens to the seed when it goes in the ground? The seed has to die before you get an apple tree. And you got to water. And you got to sunlight. And you got to fertilize. It's not just putting a seed in the ground and you get apples the next time, the next day. We walking around throwing money in the at, at, at virtual. I'm showing my age now, right? Throw money in the basket. We throw money in the basket or using Cash App or Venmo, whatever we're doing, and we're throwing it one Sunday and we're expecting that we're going to get apples the next week. Now, God is the creator of all things. He has the cattle on a thousand hills. God creates time. God, God is beyond time. So can God take a seed and, and, and cause it to grow overnight? A thousand percent. God can. But y'all trying to put God in a position where God has to do something. No, I'm sorry to break your heart, which is why we're getting into this patient suffering. 
because there's suffering that comes from God and there's suffering that we bring on ourselves. So Charles, we are we supposed to not give? No, of course. Giving is a part of giving is a form of worship. Yes, you should give. I want you to be radically generous. I don't need you to be radically generous to me. I want you to be radically generous. I want you to, to give to those that are in need, to give to those that, that are doing good works. This is why I continue to, to give to Bible Project. Does Bible Project need my monthly contribution? No. If I stopped giving my monthly contribution, the Bible Project would continue to go on and they would be just fine. I give because I'm investing in the work that they're doing because the work that they've done has been a great blessing to me. I give to uh, my family and I, we give to a school in Rwanda that's trying to create um, a virtual, a, a hybrid kind of in-person experience for children in Rwanda, as well as a, a, a hybrid virtual experience. It's a Christian-based school. And I'm giving to them so that that school can get off the ground so that they have a, a operating budget and capital so that they can they can fill grades and be a fully functioning um, a, a pre-K elementary and then eventually they want to be a middle school. So we give to, to, to Leadership and, and Excellence Academy in Rwanda. We sponsor a child in Guatemala. We sponsored, um, uh, uh, oh, I can't, uh, Lord, Evelyn. We sponsored Evelyn for years in Guatemala. And Evelyn has special needs and Evelyn is, is deaf and we have given to um, a home international, which is the orphanage um, and the adoption agency that, that is housed and works in Guatemala and it's Christian based. And so we give and we sponsor Evelyn because we believe in that work and, and we, we saw the pictures and she just won our hearts over. And so we give to that. So we give, we give to churches of global outreach and deliverance. We give to these things because we want to be generous, because giving is important, because charitable giving is important. We do not give to things that leave our children hungry. We do not give to things that leave us without the ability to, to pay the lights, to pay the water, to pay the mortgage. Give Caesar what Caesar's. We give, but we don't give in such a way that, that means that we're not paying our taxes. You can't be a Christian and be a debtor. Well, I mean, you can't. That's not, I, I didn't say that the right way. You can't be a Christian and be negligent with your debt. You, you can't just deny someone payment and say, I'm, I'm giving to the church. That's not what Jesus is about. Go pay the temple tax. Peter, go, go down to the river and, and catch a fish. And the fish you pull out, open its mouth. It'll have a coin. It'll be enough for my taxes and your taxes. Pay your taxes. Pay your bills. Pay what you owe. Pay what you owe. What kind of testimony are you offering when people know that you owe them money and you Chuck in and, and dodging and diving them, not paying what you owe, but but you know, Tom, I gotta I gotta give to the church, I gotta give to the church. Pay what you owe first. That's a more powerful witness. You owe money, you're giving it to the church, you're not doing God any favors. You're you're making God look great. Oh Lord Jesus. God help me. I don't I know I lost people. I know I lost folks and I and I apologize that 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 I know I lost some of y'all but I look the spirit has me here for a reason. We making and I'm going to say we. We making good. I don't want anyone to feel like I'm pointing the finger at. We making God look greedy. When we give to the church and we don't pay our debts, we make God look greedy. God does not need your $100. God doesn't need your $1 billion. It's God. Giving is for us. It's not for God. And once upon a time, I would say giving was for the infrastructure, for the, for, for, you know, for the church, for the building, for the edifice. Those things are great. God doesn't need them. We need them. God doesn't need the electric guitar and the keyboard and the lights and the smoke machine and, and, and the stage. 
We need that. God doesn't need that. Somehow we have created a worship experience that, that, that feels good in our bodies and we've called that the anointing. And so then all the trappings that go with that, that need to be paid for, that, that need to be invested and funded and resourced, we've said we're given to the church so that we can have a good show when we go to Sundays. And so we're not paying other things so that we can contribute to the show and all the while calling it godliness and righteousness. And the world is looking at Christianity like y'all y'all have a show, you packing out stadiums, but half the people in there are in debt. That's an indictment on Christianity and makes God look greedy. God does not need your money. This is why we don't push giving here. Yes, there, there are expenses that we have. Y'all have heard me do this before. Yes, there are expenses that we have. They're not exorbitant. They're not massive. Yes, we have expenses, but we don't push money because God doesn't need your money. God needs your worship. God needs your heart. God needs your intention. God needs you to not cuss people out that cut you off. Now I'm talking to myself. God needs you to not cuss people out that aren't kind to you. God needs you to not be indifferent to people that are indifferent to you. God needs you to show love and kindness to those that make it hard to be loving and kind to. That's what God needs. God don't want your $10,000 if you're sucking your teeth and gossiping at work. God don't want your $100,000 if you cutting people off and moving through life privileged like you somebody. Lord Jesus, I'm not even in the text. But God don't need your money to be permission for you to act reckless, to be a child of the devil. And in America, we've decided that we can act any old kind of way if we give because we're giving to God. No, you're not. You're giving to a show. You're giving to a building. You're giving to a person or a family. You're not giving to God. Lord, help us. Jesus, speak to us, sir. We have gotten Christianity confused in America. And we've missed the fact that, yes, Suffering is a part of it. Look at verse seven. I got 10 minutes to try to get through the rest of this chapter. Look at verse seven, chapter five of James. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience, in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Now we're getting somewhere. This is, this is the part where you really lose people. Talk about money. Talk about suffering. As you know, we count as blessed those who persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the mighty Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. We love the story of Job because at the end he got double. That's why we love the story of Job. What if Job just died? What if it was like Elijah at the end, where there was no, no Elijah chariots of fire? What if it was just like Elisha, who got sick, fell ill, did not recover, died. The story of Job should still have the same impact if for whatever reason the storyteller chose to end it with Job uh, dying eventually of his illness, not recovering, not getting double, just simply dying. Because the story is the same. The point of the story of Job is that God is a big God that is beyond our understanding, and God has a plan and a will that we aren't capable of appreciating. And so just because someone suffers doesn't mean that they committed sin. They may, they may be reaping something that they sown earlier, 
but it's not necessarily, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. Suffering doesn't mean unrighteousness. In fact, sometimes suffering is a result of righteousness because we're patiently waiting the return of our Lord. And what I talked about in Bible studies is very tempting when we looked at um, uh, uh, James chapter four earlier when I was referencing the two kinds of wisdom. That was James chapter three that we looked at last Sunday. James chapter four that we looked at during Bible study, we talked about how that the, the world is enmity is an enemy of God and how for some Christians, they internalize that by developing these communities where they go off in the wilderness and they sort of live off the land because they're patiently waiting for God. And, and they interpret this idea of the world being an enemy to God of just, I need to then dismiss myself from the world. I need to remove myself entirely from the world. Let me get around a community of like-minded believers and let us serve each other. Let us serve the Lord and serve the poor and serve the marginalized off in this community where we don't get caught up in the world. And I said uh, Thursday during Bible study, that was very tempting, but I don't believe that's what James is saying here. I believe part of James's testimony is there's a way to suffer in patience that glorifies God. Remember when Jesus talked about fasting, he said, don't scrunch up your face. Don't make it obvious that you're fasting. Wash your face, brush your teeth, greet uh, uh, people in the marketplace, go to work, do the things that you do. Everyone doesn't need to know that you're fasting. God knows that you're fasting. God who sees in secret will reward you. You don't need to make a big show. Everybody doesn't need to know that you're suffering. Everybody doesn't need to know that you're going through something for Christ's sake. The atmosphere does. The heavenly dimension does. The, the, the ruler of this world, the accuser does. The accuser sees you suffering like Job and sees you not cursing God. That's powerful enough. So that when the accuser comes, God can say, have you considered Queenie Nelson? Look at how her testimony is unwavering. Look at all the weights that you put on her and she hasn't buckled and she hasn't cursed me and she hasn't walked away. Look at Frances Kelly. Look at how she's endured. Yeah, you can bring the accusations, but I see with my own too that she shows up every day and her coworkers don't know what she's going through and she's bearing it with righteousness and graciousness. Have you considered my servants? There's a beauty in patient suffering while we're waiting on the Lord, not running off in a corner somewhere, not hiding our head in the sand, but serving the Lord God through suffering, serving the Lord God through trials and tribulation, serving the Lord God patiently waiting, knowing that our help is coming, whether it comes in this world or it comes in the world to come. But we're giving God glory by patiently enduring not by chasing the material gain of this world, not by tricking ourselves into luxurious living and calling that anointing. Can I have a luxurious life and still be a Christian? Yes, but don't think for one moment that that's the anointing. Don't think because you got two cars and you got a nice home, that's because it's the anointing. You made good decisions with your money. You made smart decisions as you navigated the world system, but it passes away, baby. The Bible tells us, Jesus said, be careful where you lay up your wealth. Don't put too much of your time, too much of your resources, and things that will corrupt. You can't take your cars with you. You can't take your 401k with you. You can't take your stuff with you. Huh? Oh, but make sure that while you're walking through this life, um, that you're laying up treasures in heaven uh, where moth does not corrupt, uh, where rust cannot get to. Uh, as you're making your way through this life, uh, sure, if you've been wise with your money uh, and you want to take a vacation, we're taking a vacation. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but don't think for a moment that your vacation means that you're holy. Uh, don't think for a moment that your vacation means that you're anointed. Huh? Don't think just because you sowed a uh, $1,000 in a ministry, huh? that brings you any closer to God. Huh? How are you treating those that you don't have to be nice to? Huh? 
I don't care that you're respectful to your boss. Um, I don't care that you're respectful to your manager. Um, how do you treat the person uh, that you may not ever see again? Uh, how do you treat that stranger um, who's looking at you crazy? Um, are you ready to fight um, or do you have the grace of God? Um, are you suffering patiently um, or are you taking it out on everyone around you? Um, I'm here to tell you, people of God, uh, there's a patient suffering um, that is required. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you can't have nice things, uh, but nice things do not mean that you are righteous with God. Uh, do not mix up material gain uh, with holiness. Uh, I'm here to tell you uh, that the nicer your house uh, is not getting you any closer to God, uh, that a mansion in this world uh, doesn't mean you got a mansion waiting for you in glory. Uh, in fact, I'm reminded of what Jesus said, uh, that the last uh, will be first. Uh, and so while you're busy uh, uh, climbing the ladder, uh, while you're busy cutting the legs out, uh, from everyone that's next to you, huh? stepping over people, huh? trying to get up top. Huh? Just remember, huh? when you get to the front of the line here, huh? you're going to be in the back of the line over there. Huh? Somebody give God praise. Huh? Patiently suffer huh? while we wait for the Lord Jesus. Huh? There's a beauty of grace huh? in walking through trials and temptations. Huh? There's a beauty and grace in, in enduring uh, like a good soldier. Uh, your brothers and sisters on earth uh, may not see the benefit of your testimony, uh, but I'm here to tell you uh, that every time Beelzebub, uh, every time the devil uh, tries to raise an accusation, uh, you and I are among those uh, that God points to. Uh, and says, I got some uh, prophets uh, that did not bow the knee. Uh, I got some prophets uh, who have not succumbed. Uh, I got some people uh, who have a testimony, uh, suffer in patience, uh, and God will be glorified. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your grace and your anointing. Thank you for the spirit of truth that speaks through this weak and earthen vessel. Oh, this vessel that is unworthy. I'm thankful, Lord. Thank you for your people that choose to invest their time here week after week. Thank you, God, that they have chosen to share in worship with me here at my connected church. Thank you that you are our God. Oh, God, I pray that you pour your spirit out on every house that's listened, that's watched, that you bless each and every individual. Lord, I pray that the spirit of favor and abundance of anointing would shower down, that they would be so full of peace. Come the trials and temptations, they would not waver, and that their testimony would be that they are always gracious. Uh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, I hope y'all can still hear me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. I pray that their testimony would be that they are gracious, that they represent your kingdom. Hallelujah. Testimony would be that they are gracious and that they represent your kingdom well, Lord, and that come what may, they are a living testimony. Wherever they go, whomever they are among, that they are known as the children of God because of their testimony, because of the patience and grace that they display, even in the midst of suffering. Lord, that they are living witness, that they are the epistles, the letters with your love written on their hearts. 
and that we together um, would have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life uh, so that when the time may come, you would look upon us and you would say, well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You have been a good steward over those few things. And now, now, you shall be a ruler over many. Come, enter the rest of the world. Family of God, I appreciate you. Thank you for being with us this day, this Father's Day. Love and blessings to all the fathers out there, all the dads, all the parents that have carried the load when they have been uh, uh, left on their own. And so we celebrate and acknowledge and, and, and thank God for each of you and, and for those that are part of a two-parent household and we're celebrating fathers today, we celebrate you as well. Thank you so much. Continue to keep my family and I in your prayers, particularly over the next couple of weeks while we're away. Bless us and uh, bless each and every one of you. Family, thank you so much, MCC fam. We love you very much. We appreciate you. As we wrap it up and we say every week, stay safe, stay healthy, stay in this fight for your faith. God bless you, family.